All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Vikram from the University of Washington, and I'm going to be talking about uh, wireless analytics for 3D printed objects. Uh, this is joint work with Justin Chan and Ian Colhane, and it's advised by Jen Mankoff and Sean Kolakota. So first off, what do we mean when I say uh, analytics? Our goal here is to track the use of functional 3D printed objects over time. So for example, prosthetics like the Phoenix hand shown here have a pretty high rate of abandonment. But what if we could actually track when a user opens and closes that hand, or even how much they open and close it? This could give us important data about how people are actually, uh, you know, how they're interested in actually using these things. And similarly, we can think of other everyday objects like plastic pill bottles. If we could detect when a user actually turns the cap to open the bottle, we could do things like, say, send a reminder to, um, to make sure someone takes their medication or make sure that they haven't taken too much. So really, our goal here is to embed wireless sensing into these printed objects. Now, if we think beyond everyday objects that we use, we can imagine also more exciting applications like tracking the motion of a printed hand like this and mapping that to control a robot arm. So at this point, I've shown you some cool things that we could do if we could track the use of 3D printed objects. And the most obvious way to do that would be to attach electronic sensors to them. But this introduces a few different problems. And the first is that requires designers to have a pretty strong understanding of electronics. Um, so on top of making the mechanical structure, uh, they need to understand how to design the circuits and the software that these things need. But second of all, electronics always require some kind of power source. So that means we have to add a battery or a close-by RFID reader to get our electronic system working. So in this work, we take a completely different approach and co-design our 3D printed objects and sensors together to create plastic objects that can communicate without any circuits. So we call this work printed analytics, which is a wireless and circuitless platform that can capture, store, and transmit information about the use of printed objects. I'm going to talk about this in the context of three motivating applications. The first is printed prosthetics, second, smart pill bottles, and last, a wireless <laughs> insulin pen. To give you an overview, I'm going to start by explaining how we build these 3D printed objects and uh, how they can communicate. Second, I'll talk about how we can decode the data that we receive from them and use that to track motion. And last, I'll talk about how we can actually store information within these objects so that we can uh, enable analytics outside of our wireless range. So let's start with how we can 3D print wireless communication. To understand this, first we have to answer a more basic question. How can a plastic object without any circuitry actually communicate? The answer to this is unlike things like Wi-Fi chips, our printed objects communicate using reflections. And this really just requires three different components. The first is an antenna. The second is a switch. And the last thing is the message that we want to transmit. So the way this works is we have an incoming radio signal uh, that hits this antenna. And then when we toggle that switch, it changes how the antenna absorbs or reflects that radio signal. So the key thing to remember here is that we can use a switch to produce a changing reflection. And so by controlling the switch, we can encode data within that signal. So I've shown you now at a high level how this technique called backscatter works. But let's go a little deeper and see how we can build each of these components that I showed you here. So to start out, 
let's look at how we can design and build a 3D printed antenna. The first step is we start out with some pretty well-known reference designs for antennas. But the problem is we can't just copy these exactly because antennas are highly dependent on the material properties of what you use to make them. So the second step is to really get good performance. We model our antennas using an electromagnetic, sorry, an electromagnetic simulator. And we optimize parameters like the length of the antenna, which affects the frequency, and the width, which affects the bandwidth of the antenna. And uh, once, once we do this, we can come up with you know, the optimal design for our, um, uh, to use with a conductive 3D printer filament. The last step, of course, is to actually print it out. Um, we use a dual material 3D printer that can, can uh, print normal plastic as well as a conductive material. And here's an example on the right showing a dipole antenna that we actually use in this work. So the next question is, how do we build a switch? Remember that for things like a pill bottle that I talked about, we need it to be able to move in both directions. So the main components of our switch are we have a conductive contact and a spring. On the left here, I have um, a picture of our cantilever spring and a gear. Now note that this spring is symmetric and so it can move either up or down. And so when the gear turns counterclockwise, it's going to push that spring down. When it turns clockwise, it's going to push the spring up. Now if we look at the reverse side, uh, we see this is where we have the switch contact and the antennas. And both of those are made with conductive 3D printer filament. And this red dot that I've got here is just showing where those two sides are connected. Again, when we turn the, that gear that I showed you counterclockwise, we're going to push that switch contact down to touch the bottom antenna. And in the reverse direction, it'll move up and touch the top. So here's an example of our switch integrated with the Phoenix hand. And we can see here in this video that when we turn it, it, um, it moves either up and down. Uh, and the switch contact is actually touching the antennas. Then at the bottom here, we have a plot of what our received radio signal looks like, where each of these little peaks in the signal corresponds to when the switch actually touched the antenna. So now I've talked about how we actually build our printed objects. Next, let's understand how we can actually decode these wireless signals. So the first step to decoding these reflections is we record them using a software-defined radio. And if we look at the raw radio signal, we get something that looks like this, where we can see these little peaks that correspond to our data, as well as lots of noise from the environment. So the next step that we take is we apply a narrow bandpass filter to isolate the, um, uh, the data that's being reflected by our object. And last, we apply a threshold to this to count the number of peaks, and that corresponds to the information um, that we're actually getting from the object. So this works great when we're pretty close to our, our uh, wireless transmitter. But what happens when we get farther away? If we look at these signals, our reflections get progressively weaker as we move farther away from an access point. And really, the problem here is that to communicate using reflections, we need the original radio signal to reflect. So what, what's happening here is our incoming signal that we're reflecting is actually overpowering our weak, ref, uh, our weak data signal that we're getting from the printed object as we move to farther ranges. You can think that our receiver is listening to two people at the same time, where one of them is yelling really loudly and then the other is whispering very, very quietly. We call this problem self-interference, and that is really what limits our range. So how do we solve this? Our solution is to actually cancel out that original transmitter signal. If we think about it, that signal that we're sending, that what we're reflecting, is something that looks like a sine wave. And at a high level, if we can create an inverted version of that sine wave, we can add those things together, 
and cancel it out. So then we can hear our weak reflection on top of this. In practice, the way we do this is by using um, RF components like phase shifters um, to basically create the inverse of our transmitted signal and then add it back at the receiver. So how well does this cancellation work? We test this by placing a transmitter on one side of the room and our receiver on the other side. And then we have our printed object that we move uh, across the room in the middle. We measure performance by checking the number uh, of bit errors that we get from our, from our printed object. And we can see that here on this plot, when we don't have any kind of cancellation, we have a 50% error rate, which means we're just randomly guessing for each one of our bits. But as soon as we turn on our cancellation, we can see that over this four meter range that we have, it actually works pretty well with the, uh, the worst performance coming in the middle where the system starts to fail. So uh, at this point I've showed you how we can receive wireless signals across a room. And next let's see how we can map that to track rotational motion. So here I'm going to play a video of the Phoenix hand moving again, uh, as well as the, the backscatter signal that we get from it. Here you can see we get six of these peaks, and I'm going to play it just one more time. And we've rotated it 90 degrees, and that corresponds to six, um, basically six gear positions that we've rotated past. So what we can do is, by knowing the structure of the gear, we can map that number of peaks directly to the angle of rotation. We test this across the full 180 degree uh, range of motion of the hand, and we can see that we get the increase that we expect as we, um, as we rotate to larger angles. Now, I've shown you how we can measure the angle itself, but how do we figure out which direction it moves? On the last slide, what I showed you was just a simple gear that had all of its teeth. But to sense direction, what we do is instead, we make an asymmetric gear that looks something like this. Basically, we take out a few of the gear teeth, and so now we have this pattern of six followed by four followed by three that we're going to get when uh, we turn clockwise. And that's exactly the pattern of peaks that we get in our reflected signal. Of course, when we turn it in the opposite direction, we'll get um, the, the opposite uh, of, of these reflections. We'll get the three followed by the four followed by the six. So up until this point, I've shown you how we can receive data up to a few meters away from an access point. But what happens if we go even farther away? People may use these printed objects um, for, far away from an access point. So I'm going to talk quickly about how we can enable um, or how we can use storage to enable analytics outside our wireless range. Uh, if we look at this in the context of an insulin pen, we can see first what our requirements really are. What we'd like to do is store the number of times that insulin pen has been pressed and then accumulate that data to see a total of how much has been dispensed. Last, of course, when we get back within our wireless range, we want to um, upload that data. Now, the way that we do this is we store information mechanically by using the force of that button press to coil up a spring. Now, if we think we can coil up a spring and it's going to store energy, but how do we keep it coiled up and do that in a controlled way? Our key idea here is to use a ratchet to coil up this spring. Now a ratchet is a mechanism that can only turn in one direction. So on the left here we can see that as we, um, uh, you know, as, as our ratchet mechanism turns in the counterclockwise direction, it can easily slide past these teeth at the bottom. But on the opposite side, if it tries to turn the other way, it'll get stuck. So what we're doing here is our ratchet is helping us accumulate rotation in this spring. And then when you press a release mechanism, that allows the spring to rotate freely once again. And here's just a quick video of what that looks like. We can see each time we press the button, our, um, our ratchet turns uh, counterclockwise. 
And in just a second, we press this release, and we can see we get our backscattered data. So just a few ways that we can improve on this in the future. Um, the first thing is to improve the form factor of these objects and uh, make them smaller and better integrated with our designs. We can also look at um, ways to store additional data, such as like individual data points rather than just accumulating information and maybe storing the time that these were recorded. And of course, we'd always like to improve our wireless range to hopefully get this to work across a whole home. So in conclusion, I've shown you how printed objects can communicate and store information about uh, how they're used, and this enables analytics uh, for things like printed prosthetics, pill bottles, and wireless insulin pens. Thank you. Okay, first question, Dan. Hi, Dan Ashbrook, University of Copenhagen. This is really nifty work. Um, I was watching the uh, this, um, radio trace and yeah. wondering about um, getting more information like uh, force by, um, I guess it would be like amp the length of the peak, because you're just doing all these momentary contacts, but if yeah. I push harder, I might have a longer time that the uh, two plates are in contact and make, a, uh, make more yeah, that's okay. definitely something you can do. Uh, what we are looking at here is just a simple, you know, number of things that we yeah. get. But by looking at other things like the, the spacing between those, you can get a lot more information about, you know, the physical force to apply to the object. Yeah. And so then uh, another thing that occurred to me was wondering, do you have any thoughts on how you might store time? Because for your pen, the insulin pen, you might want to know when in the day that was um, injected. But hard yeah, to... Yeah. So, that would be uh, that would definitely be kind of tricky to have like a you know an absolute time mm -hmm. reference. Um, but one thing that you might be able to do is you could have say you know multiple um, you know uh, like ratchet type storage things mm -hmm. where um, you, uh, you you could store you know a different bit of information in each one. Um, of course, you could also make an entire mechanical clock and integrate that into this. That would give you your absolute time reference, but it depends really on how, you, how complicated you want yeah. to make this. Yeah. Definitely in favor of that. I look forward to seeing it. Okay, and as the next speaker is setting up, I have another question for you. So as the range increases, there might be a desire to support multiple devices in the same area. How might we go about that? Yeah, so... Um, w one way that we can support different devices is basically having each device use its own its own type of wireless code. So you, those gears that we had, um, we can basically embed whatever pattern we want on them. Um, so you can have each uh, each device would have uh, a different pattern of of symbols that it would send. Um, so then you know which which device you're looking for. Okay, great. Let's uh, thank our speaker.